Who is the real rock of the church? Is it Peter? Or is it Jesus? Is it something else entirely? I mean, one of the most controversial lines in the Bible comes when Jesus takes his disciples on a field trip. Standing in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus declares, And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. For centuries, people have debated what Jesus really means when he says these words. Is he building his church upon Peter? Does this mean that Satan can't prevail over the church? What do all of these terms like rock and gates of hell really mean? And in season four of The Chosen, they seem to leave this answer open-ended. For weeks, fans have argued about what the show believes and more importantly, what scripture really means. So in this video, we're gonna dive deep into scripture and finally figure out what Jesus really means when he says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. But first, if you love learning insights about The Chosen and want to see connections between the show and the Bible that will transform the way you watch it, then click the link above and down in the description to download my free resource called Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in The Chosen. This will show you connections to scripture and the first century world of Jesus that are present in the show, but most people don't notice. We've packed a whole lot of information into a really small package, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. So one day, Jesus decides to take his disciples on a field trip. And strangely enough, I'm not really kidding when I use that phrase. There are many times when Jesus and his disciples travel to heal and perform miracles, but not today. Today is all about education. Jesus has something that he wants to teach his disciples, and he's taking them to a place that will get this lesson across in a powerful way. Jesus takes his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is about 25 miles away from Galilee. But more importantly, Caesarea Philippi is a pagan temple. In fact, Jesus' disciples would have been very uncomfortable going to a place like this. The Jewish law is very clear about getting too close to pagan practices. In Leviticus, God says, Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Jews aren't even really supposed to associate with pagans, lest they be led away from the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, you see one story after another warning of this, demonstrating the dangers that can befall people if they're drawn too close to pagan practices and pagan gods. The general practice at that time was stay away from all things pagan. And yet here, Jesus leads them straight to these pagan premises. Because Jesus wants to make a point. And they have to see it to understand it. You see, Caesarea Philippi had a long history of pagan worship. In the days of the Old Testament, this was a region that had been overrun with the worship of Baal. And closer to the time of Jesus, it was the site of the world's largest temple for the pagan god Pan. Pan was a god of fertility, and Caesarea Philippi reflected this. People would gather to perform all sorts of fertility rituals. Giant phallic symbols would be placed in apses and other locations around the temple to honor Pan. Smaller phallic statues were placed around for his nymphs, and it was believed that this would entice him to mate with them, which would cause all people to be blessed with fertility. But for the same reason, the people also performed their own fertility rituals. Rituals involving temple prostitutes, goats, since Pan was part goat, and other deplorable acts. I mean, if you were to ask a Jew in Galilee what was the darkest, most wicked place they knew, most would probably have mentioned Caesarea Philippi. But there was another spot in Caesarea Philippi that cast an equally, if not greater darkness, the gates of hell. You see, Caesarea Philippi sits at the base of Mount Hermon. It's a lush area filled with lush foliage and streams of water. And one of those streams leads into a cave called the gates of Hades. Inside of this cave, there was a deep chasm into which the water fell. And people believed that this chasm led directly to the underworld. It was a gate into Hades. And because of this, those who worshipped there believed that this gave them a unique access to the gods that they worshipped. They believed that their lewd acts would draw out these gods and entice them to act on their behalf. But here's the thing. These gods weren't the only ones who were worshipped in this place. Because remember, the name of this site is Caesarea Philippi. And that's because it was renamed to honor a new god, the emperor. 
Not long before Jesus was born, Herod the Great and later his son Philip began converting it into temples and other shrines devoted to worshiping the Roman Emperor Caesar. Hence the name Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea for Caesar and Philippi for Herod's son Philip. This was a place that proclaimed that the emperor was a god worthy of worship. And so it is in light of all of that that we now can look at what Jesus says in this moment. And so let's take a look not just at the controversial lines from this moment, but the entire passage where Jesus is teaching his disciples. Jesus takes his disciples to this pagan place of worship. And Mark tells us, Now when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So just imagine this. In the midst of all of this pagan worship, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples know that Son of Man is a reference to the Messiah. So as all of these people below are worshiping these gods that they believe will save them from infertility and save the empire, Jesus asks, who do people say that your Savior is? And look at how the disciples reply. And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, people are saying all kinds of things. There's lots of rumors floating around. And so Jesus gets even more pointed with his question. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And notice what Jesus does here. He says, who do you say that I am? He's making it very clear that he is the Messiah. In this temple devoted to pagan gods, he says, who do you say that I am? And it says that Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, pay close attention because I don't want you to miss this. He says, you are the Christ, right? Which is another word meaning the Messiah. But then look at what he says after that. He says, you are the son of the living God. Peter is saying, unlike all of these other gods here, right? Unlike this emperor who claims to be a son of God, you are the son of the living God, the true God, the real God. They are imposters, but you are the true one who we should worship. Now, what's really important to notice here is that in Mark's gospel especially, this is the first time that any of the disciples has proclaimed who Jesus truly is. This is a huge statement that Peter is making. And so in light of that and everything else going on here, let's look at these controversial words from Jesus. It says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Do you see how the setting changes everything? Do you see how it puts everything into perspective? Jesus is saying, Simon, Peter, you get it. You realize who I truly am. This is is what the world believes in, all this stuff around here, but you, you know who the true Messiah is. They see false gods, but you see the true God. And then at the foot of this mountain, this massive rock, at the bottom of which is this deep cavern called the gates of hell, Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I mean, these words aren't random, my friends. For the disciples, all sorts of things are clicking as they hear these words. Because think about what people are looking at here. Often we hear Jesus' words and we just hear Jesus saying that hell can't overpower the church. But think about the setting, right? They're looking at the gates of hell. The church doesn't have the gates. Hell has the gates. And, and then the word that Jesus uses here for overpower is this word katiskyo. And it's a word that means to be strong enough. And so what Jesus is really saying here isn't hell won't overcome us. He's saying the gates of hell can't hold us back. The gates of hell aren't strong enough to resist us. We are going to conquer hell. We're going to conquer this, this false worship, this prostitution and debauchery and depravity, these empty things that people are putting their hopes in. We're going to conquer that. This is the mission of the church. And this is what Jesus is establishing that day. This is what he's declaring in that line. This is the rock, the foundation upon which he is establishing his church. But this doesn't rule Peter out altogether because Peter is a huge part of this mission. And Matthew's gospel does something really interesting to make sure that we know that. 
In Matthew's gospel, this is the first and only time that Jesus calls him Peter. Right? He calls him Simon, he even calls him Satan, but this is the only time he calls him Peter. Matthew refers to him as Peter throughout the gospel, but this is the only time that Jesus does. And what's even more interesting is that the word that's used for Peter is the Greek word petros. But here's what's unique about this word petros. There's another word for rock in Greek, lithos, which means a stone or a smaller rock. But the word petros is used to refer to a cliff or even bedrock. So again, in front of this giant 70 foot tall cliff upon which sat Mount Hermon, Jesus says to Peter, you are no longer Simon, you are now Peter. Your name is Rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Which brings us back to our original question. So is Peter the rock of the church? And the answer is yes and no. You see, as we saw when we look closely at this passage, the setting matters. As Jesus stands before this rock, he's establishing his mission to attack the gates of hell. This is the giant rock upon which he's establishing his church, but he's also putting Peter at the center of that mission. He's the only one at this point who truly understands who Jesus is. He's going to be a key figure in bringing this mission to life. You see, it's so tempting for us to want simple, defined answers when reading the Bible, but that's not always how it's written. Jesus often responded to difficult questions, not with answers, but with more questions. He wants us to think, to wrestle. And this moment is meant to make us wrestle, to see all of the imagery and to realize that this isn't just a bunch of coincidences. It matters that they're standing in front of a rock. It matters that Peter's name means rock. And it matters to Jesus that we strive, no matter how hard and frustrating it might be, to discern the true significance of all of that. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Now, before you go, if you haven't done it yet, make sure to click the link above and down in the description to download a free resource called Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in the Chosen. And if you'd like to see more videos breaking down episodes of The Chosen, then just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.